and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human traditions. Now, this is a very powerful statement from Jesus. It is an indictment of the religious leaders and rulers of his day and of our day and of every day who turn to their own understanding, their own interpretation, their own preferences, their own doctrines, their own human devised plans and beliefs and elevate them above the word and will of God. It's amazing and sad to me to realize that at this very point, this very point is where the church has failed so repeatedly throughout the 2,000 years of its existence. The very thing, the very reason why Jesus was uh, persecuted and then arrested and tried by the Jews, the very fact that they, 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 they resented his calling them hypocrites. They resented his criticizing them. They resented him speaking up against them and pointing out their failings. They resented this on this very issue. And yet the church does the same thing. The church lifts up its own traditions, its own rules and regulations as being superior to the calling that God has for us, the calling that we have received in the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord, the calling to love God and love neighbor as self. The church has established its own rules and regulations and judged people as worthy or not worthy based upon those rules and regulations, just like the scribes and the Pharisees. And you see, Jesus was an insider. Jesus was himself a Pharisee. He wasn't a Sadducee. He wasn't an Essene. He wasn't a zealot. Jesus was a Pharisee. He believed in interpreting and implying, applying the Scripture. He was one of them. And so he is criticizing them from the inside, knowing them very well. And they resented this deeply. They resented it and so they sought to have him killed. And yet we do the same things that Jesus is decrying. His charge, his indictment, hypocrite could apply to the church today. You abandon the commandment of God. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human Tradition. And what did Isaiah say? This people honors me with their lips. They say, praise God. They say, praise the Lord. They say the right things outwardly. But their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me. Worthless is their worship, literally. Teaching human precepts as if they were doctrines. The difference between, first of all, the head and the heart needs to be lifted up here. In the ancient world, the ancient world, they seated the self, the identity, the ego, not in the brain, not in the head, but right here in the heart. We say that this is the source of emotion and the head is the source of thought. In the ancient world, it was the heart, the cardia, that was the source of thought, the source of your identity, the source of who you were. And they moved also down another foot. They moved the emotional center to their guts. It's, it's a strange thing to read in the King James where it says that someone's bowels were refre refreshed by an event. It means that they were made happy and rejoiceful, literally. 
We feel with our hearts and think with our heads. In the ancient world, they, they felt with their guts and thought with their hearts. So what Isaiah is saying here is, their hearts are far from me, means you could possibly translate that as their minds, their very selves are far from me. It's not just about emotion, my friends. It's about your very being. It's about, about your very way of thinking, about your very way of living, about your very identity. They themselves, in their totality, in their wholeness, they themselves are very far from me. Isaiah said, speaking for God. This is an indictment. An indictment that is made by Jesus, quoting Isaiah, an indictment that is made against all of the religious leaders of his day. This indictment was one of the many that was used against Jesus himself when he was tried and convicted and sent on to Pilate for sentencing and execution. He criticized them. He called them hypocrites, and they killed him for it. And yet the church does the same kind of things today. Listen to me, all of you, and understand, Jesus said. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. Now, right here, modern preachers have to pause for a moment and issue a little reminder. Just as the seat of the uh, intellect, the seat of the person, was moved from the head to the heart in the ancient world, so also they had no conception of germs. This wasn't a bit uh, an understanding that you, if you ate, you might, you might get germs. They didn't have that understanding in the ancient world. It was a ritual cleanliness, a ritual defilement that they were concerned about. And they believed that if you wash something on the outside, that washing would reflect it being clean on the inside. And what Jesus is saying, no, it's not what goes in that makes you spiritually defiled. It's what comes out of you that makes you spiritually defiled. Now, just a reminder to the children in the congregation, this doesn't mean that you can go to the dinner table with unwashed hands. If you try that, you'll get the same treatment I got when I did that and mother said, sorry, you're not Jesus, go back and wash your hands, okay? Yes, I was smart aleck enough to try that one 101 time. Didn't work. Didn't work. The defilement here is not physical, it's spiritual. Now, keep this in mind. It's important. Because sometimes bad things happen to people. Uh, people get abused as children or even as adults, and they think that they themselves are responsible for that, or that having that abuse occur to them somehow makes them filthy or unclean. And that is not the case. Jesus himself says that's not the case. It's not what goes into you. It's what comes out of you that reveals the true nature of your being and whether or not it's defiled. Whether or not it's defiled. It's not what goes in. It's how we consider others and how we treat others. How we ill consider others or ignore the personhood, value, worth, and intrinsic sanctity of others. That is what defiles us. How we treat others, how we consider others, how we reject others, how we fail to offer a word of peace, a word of hope, a word of comfort, a word of love, how we fail to share the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord with others. When we fail, this is what defiles us. And it comes out of us. The defilement comes out of us in many different ways. And then he gives this long list. And it's a racy list. It has sex in it. And that's what people are most interested in in this world. It's the sex stuff. Every time I'm asked about this list, I'm never asked about envy or slander or pride or fall. I'm asked about the sex stuff, friends. That's what the world's interested in. So let's take a look at this list. And it starts off with one of the sex words, fornication. The Greek word is pornea. We get the word pornography from it. But what does it really mean? 
Think with yourself for just a moment. Each one of these words in this list, if you had to write a definition of them without recourse to a dictionary, could you do it? You could make a stab at a few of them, but most of them will probably elude you to one degree or another. And especially when it comes to them as translated words. Because the word pornea doesn't have that general sense that it's usually given. Literally, in all of Greek literature, in classical Greek, and in the Koine Greek, the Greek of the age, the Greek of the language that was spoken in the time of Jesus in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, when the New Testament was written in the Greek language, the word pornea had one really specific meaning. Prostitute. Woo. Prostitution? Yep. Or as uh, the, 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 um, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, renders it often, harlot for hire. Hmm. So prostitution is on this list. Theft, well, that's obvious. It means taking something that isn't yours. Okay, that's easy. Murder, killing something without reason or without the need of defense, literally. Oh, good, another good sex word. We can have fun with this one. Adultery, which literally means sexual relations that violate the marriage covenant. And it can happen multiple different ways. Both people involved in it on both sides can be married. One can be married, the other need not be. It's still adultery. Sexual relations outside of the marriage covenant with someone who is in a married covenant relationship. Hmm. Okay. Now, why would any of these re be representative of what defiles on the inside at, or I define it how Ill, we ill consider others or ignore the personhood, value, worth, and intrinsic sanctity of others. Well, with prostitution, we're objectivizing another person. There is no love in this relationship. There is simply lust, and it is the sex in exchange for money, which is uh, abusing people. So there's a problem there. Theft, obvious. You're taking something that belongs to somebody else. Murder, obvious. You're killing somebody. Adultery is violating a covenant relationship. It is harming the other people in the marriage that aren't involved in the sex as well as those who are. So each one of these, it's harming people. One of the best definitions of sin is harming another. Because whatever is not from love is sin. Let's keep going. Avarice. If you had to define avarice, no English teachers can answer this question. If you had to define avarice, could you do it? It means greed. It means envy. It means to covet or desire for yourself someone else's stuff. And to plot to get it. That's avarice. Wickedness. Well, that's a fun one. That sounds like a lot of fun. Wickedness. It literally means evil or rejoicing in wrongdoing. It means lacking in social or moral values. Deceit. Deceitfulness. Duplicity. Misleading or fraudulent behavior. Licentiousness. Now that's a tough one. That's not a word you use every day, is it? Licentiousness. Sounds awfully racy, doesn't it? What does it mean? Lacking in legal or moral restraint. Going beyond proper bounds or limits in society. Especially regarding, but not limited to, sexual matters. Aha! I knew there had to be something sex in there, yeah. It translates a word which means to see what you want and do it regardless of the consequences. And it is often synonymous with immoral. Hmm. Envy. Oh, that one ought to be easy, except it's a bad translation. It's actually the same word as translated above for wickedness. It's the same word in Greek translated above wickedness 
Here it has a different meaning, a different, different formation in the part of speech. It means morally worthless or amoral. Ooh. Slander. The word translated here is, from the Greek is blasphemy. And it means slanderous or harmful speech or speech that denigrates or puts down, disrespects, ignores the value or denies the value of another human being. Hmm. Pride or arrogance. This one gets me and a whole lot of us, doesn't it? And finally, folly which literally means foolishness, lack of prudence or good judgment or good sense. Wow. In a list with the biggies like murder and theft and prostitution, fornication, and, and adultery, with all of these this big ones, you got this one, bad judgment? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well... Okay, I can see us out here now with that pin going, all right, let's see. How do you score on this? Slash? All right, number one, no. Number two, well, when I was a kid, I used to take things from 7-Eleven. Mm -hmm. I've never murdered anybody. I've wanted to murder someone, maybe, but I've never murdered anybody. Adultery, nope, nope, nope. Avarice, uh, envy, wanting somebody else's stuff. Uh, yep, okay. Wickedness, uh, lacking in social or moral values. Uh, uh, do, do I rejoice in wrongdoing, though? Hmm. Seventy uh, percent. Um, uh, in, uh, envy, or as I said, it's a better translation, amoral. I hope not. Slander. We're coming up on 2016 in a presidential election. Slander. You ever watch the news? You know, I'll watch the news, I'll watch a debate, I'll find myself yelling at the television set. Remember you used to have those television throw books and you could throw it at the, at the stupid ref or the stupid reporter? I wish I had one of those today, I could throw it at that screen when I see that candidate say something absolutely stupid. And you see those words coming out of your mouth and you wish you could grab them and shove them back in because you know what you said was slander. Well, we long failed on that one. Pride or arrogance? Uh, yeah, I'm in trouble now. And foolishness. Who hasn't been foolish at least sometime in their life? And if you were to grade this, I think we'd all be in trouble. Sure, there's several on here we've never done, but there's a whole bunch we have done. And the most interesting thing of all is what that word defile actually translates. The word defile. The word we're translating as defile here throughout the entire passage is the Greek word koine, which means common, everyday, usual, together. The everyday version. The idea was they ate with common hands, hands that were touching each other, hands that were intrinsically unclean because they had been touching other hands. You ever see somebody pick up that piece of pizza at the, at the pizza buffet with their fingers and you go, oh, you don't want to touch any of the rest of the pizza or, or go there until all that pizza's gone because you don't know what pieces they've picked through elsewhere? Same idea. Common hands. Make for common bugs in our world. Common hands make for common uncleanliness, defilement in the ancient world. Well, my friends, any one of these coming out of us, any one of these, let's just pick the ones that are common to us, foolishness, pride, and slander, and coveting. Huh. Avarice, any one of these coming out of us reduces us to the common denominator of us all. And that's sinner. That's a person who is in need of forgiveness. 
a person who is in need of being cleansed, a person who is in need of being transformed. There's not a single person in this room that hasn't experienced at least one of these things coming out of them. Words that shouldn't come out, actions that shouldn't come out, envy or coveting of something that shouldn't be coming out, foolishness or pride coming out of us. And it's these things when they come out that defile us. And yet the church is very busy beating on a few of them and ignoring the rest in themselves. Picking out the ones that they think, for the most part, they're not doing and beating on other people about them and ignoring many of them that apply to us. Instead, we should be recognizing that we need to have our hearts transformed, our very center core being transformed, oriented back towards God, so that what it says here about worshiping in vain won't be true about us. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We need to have our hearts transformed and drawn closer to God. Transformed so that it is not the common denominator of sin that reigns but the universal gift of grace that reigns within us. Just as the common denominator of sin is a reality for all of us, and we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of the glory of God, so also we have the wonderful common message that is uncommon, the wonderful message of grace, the prevenient grace, the before-going grace of God which we are offered, if only we will follow Him. Not ourselves, but God. What comes out? How we live, what we say, how we treat others, how we fail to love God and love neighbor as ourself, these are the things that defile us. May we truly seek God's grace to overcome these things and instead share the love, the grace, the peace, the hope, and the presence of God with all. In the name of the Father and of the Son. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2015 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.